This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight for this evening's Exploring Ethics program here at the Sanford Consortium Collaboratory. I'm Mike Kalichman. I'm director for the Center for Ethics in Science and Technology. I'm also director for the Ethics program for the Center for the Clinical and Translational Research Institute at UC San Diego. The Ethics Center is not only interested in talking to the public. Our goal is to engage the public in conversation. We want this to be a conversation that includes academics, scientists, and the public to address the challenges that we face in science and technology. Because we're interested in those ethical dimensions, there are many questions we might ask, but one of the key questions is, how should we best conduct the research that we perform in, in the service of science? With that question in mind, we formed this summer series that's titled Meeting the Challenge of Conflicts of Interest. This 2012 summer series is three programs. Tonight is the second of the three programs. And we're looking at what happens when industry and academia collaborate. Where are the challenges and how can we best address them? This program, and in fact this entire series, is made possible by support and funding from the Legler Benbow Foundation, which has been matched by support from Pfizer, Takeda, Johnson & Johnson, as well as Connect, an organization many of you I'm sure know, UC San Diego, UCSD TV, who are broadcasting tonight's program, and the UCSD Clinical and Translational Research Institute. Those diverse supporters, those many different kinds of supporters, underline that we are not here to serve any one voice or any one constituency. We want everybody at the table to figure out how best to approach the challenges we face. To frame this evening's discussion, which we will uh, begin in a moment, I'll begin with a brief recap of the last program. If you didn't attend, it's okay. You can catch up quickly now. So one of the participants in the program was Jeremy Barton, a vice president with Pfizer. And interestingly, it was the vice president of Pfizer who gave us the quote from uh, Harvard President Derek Bach back in 1996 who said, the price of corporate support is eternal vigilance. Although Jeremy didn't go on to say um, industry is a problem or that they are the problem, I think embedded in that comment in our discussion last time was it was clear that there is eternal vigilance needed on both sides in those relationships to figure out how best to proceed because of the challenges that might occur. Everyone appears to understand the need and potential benefit for academic industry collaborations. But what isn't as clear is some of the challenges that we face. There is skepticism by many about industry's motivations. There is skepticism about the potential for academic bias in receiving industry support. And there are mutual concerns regarding fair allocation of intellectual property rights. Beyond those issues, something else that came up in our last session is a very particular change that is occurring in the way we are approaching clinical research and what comes next. Um, uh, Jeremy Barton noted that the whole field has become a lot more complex. The low-hanging fruit are gone. More specifically, Gary Firestein, the uh, director for the Clinical and Translational Research Institute at UCSD, noted that companies are now trying to find what is a relatively smaller market that has to take a particular medication. You're not getting it to 50 million people, you're getting it to 50,000 people. In that setting, what you are trying to accomplish with the academic industry collaborations is very different than what we had in the past. So in this second program in the series on meeting the challenges of conflicts of interest, we will consider a case study of academic industry collaborations specifically on the topic of personalized medicine 
a case where the goal isn't to find one blockbuster drug that everybody has to take, but instead finding strategies that might reach smaller, much smaller groups of individuals. The overall question to be addressed tonight is, what lessons can be learned about academic industry partnerships in a particular case of personalized medicine? Some related questions that might be considered during our discussion tonight are, one, does the model for academic industry collaboration need to change as we move from blockbuster drugs to precision medicine? Second, how have partnerships around opportunities for precision medicine been constructed? How has that worked out so far? And three, what has gone right and what has gone wrong with those experiences? We are fortunate tonight to have two people who can extremely well help us navigate those kinds of questions. Patrick Grudy, immediately to my left, is the Vi Divisional Vice President for Research and Development at Abbott Molecular. After he worked as a research scientist and technical support manager at other places, Pat joined Abbott in 1992. His responsibilities now include assay and systems R&D for Abbott Molecular in Illinois. And to his left is Richard Schwab, who is a member of the UC San Diego Clinical and Translational Research Institute, as I am, and director for the UCSD Moore's Cancer Center Biorepository. That, bi that biorepository consents its donors for use of their specimens by for-profit end users. Richard is also a co-founder of a startup biotechnology company focused on drug discovery. Both doctors, Grudy and Schwab, have a particular interest in personalized, or sometimes called now precision medicine. So with that in mind, I've asked doctors Grudy and Schwab to take, each take a few minutes to highlight some of their experiences as well as their perspectives about the issues we will be addressing today. Following their remarks, I will engage them briefly to address a few specific questions, which, we will, be, which will then be followed by an opportunity for you to not only ask questions, but to offer your insights and suggestions. I would like you to consider that that, that phase of the program is not just an opportunity, but an obligation for you. This is not only a conversation with the experts. We will all benefit from hearing the perceptions, understandings, and questions from one another. So if you have some thoughts, we want to hear them. With that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Pat, and he can begin. Good. Thanks very much. Uh, let me just start by saying it's a real pleasure to be here. I spent uh, the last two days up in the San Francisco area at a meeting that was called the RxDx Summit. And so we spent the last two days with various diagnostics and, and pharma companies kind of talking about a lot of the challenges that we currently face in this whole personalized medicine space. I have been with Abbott now just a little over 20 years. Uh, it's kind of funny, I started my career uh, after graduate school in an oil company, um, and I ended up in a pharma company. Um, so you never know uh, how those things work out. But uh, I would say in the 20 years that I've been in this business, um, this is probably uh, the most exciting time that I've seen. Uh, I was fortunate enough to sort of be on the, I'll call it the tail end of the beginning of some of the diagnostic work that was done um, for HIV, and, and certainly remember that as an exciting time. Uh, and I think by exciting, I mean uh, you could really see how a lot of the things that were being done back then were, were really transforming how, how patients were treated and cared for, and, and uh, that combined with some of the therapeutic breakthroughs uh, really leading to what, what I think would have to be categorized as, as tremendous breakthroughs. And yet I think that actually even dwarfs what we see, or, or what we see today dwarfs what we saw back then um, on a number of fronts. Uh, so what I think, uh, and it all came to head for us in, in December, my group actually, what we're involved in uh, is the diagnostic part of the business. Um, so I will confess up front, I'm not quite as familiar with a lot of the details on the pharma side. Um, but we work with a lot of different pharma companies uh, developing companion diagnostics for their new uh, therapeutic agents. And I'll never forget last December when we had a chance to have a patient uh, come speak to our entire uh, division, actually. We probably had three or 400 people in the room, and this patient came and spoke to us. And he was a non-small cell lung cancer patient, uh, had failed his initial therapy, uh, on his own had done a lot of research about other treatment options. and. Uh, uh, found out about uh, crizotinib at the time, which was in clinical trials, and he was not eligible for the clinical trials. And to make a long story short, despite everything he tried to do, he couldn't get into the clinical trials. Uh, and he was really, I think, at near the end of his life uh, with, with what was going on with his disease. And just at the last moment, um, Zalcori was approved, and uh, he was able to get on the drug. 
and uh, very quickly the drug, um, uh, you know, cured, not didn't cure his disease, but uh, his tumors went from being what was too numerous to count to being basically undetectable. And uh, I know for those of us in the diagnostics part of the business, we don't get to hear those stories very often. And uh, I can assure you there really wasn't a dry eye in the place um, because I think it was just a great opportunity for us to see firsthand uh, the work and the things that we do. So I will say that um, our academic and Abbott collaborations I think are really important to us for a number of perspectives, uh, not the least of which, and I think really what could be the most important. One thing we are not, we are not clinicians. Uh, and, and we honestly don't try to be clinicians. Uh, we really don't have an adequate understanding of that whole part of the space. And I think our, our collaborations with a number of academic institutions are absolutely critical to us to really understand the, the clinical implications of the things that we do and the decisions that we make. I think too often we're guilty of making decisions on a particular diagnostic product and what will work and what won't work, how it will fit in the workflow, how it won't fit in the workflow. Um, and again, there's nothing more important to us than a lot of the collaborations we have with uh, a number of our academic collaborators there. The other thing I think that's very important to us from an academic and industrial collaboration standpoint um, really centers around education. Uh, and I think education is one of those spaces that's getting increasingly difficult to manage um, from a number, for a number of reasons. But, uh, and when I say education, I mean that's education of us. Uh, we want to be educated on what matters to you and what will help you. Uh, again, I think we're really in the business of being able to provide uh, clinicians in particular with the kind of tools that can help them do a better job. Um, but then we also need help from um, key opinion leaders and, and other people, especially in the academic environment, that can help us educate others. Uh, and I will tell you, over the last two days up in San Francisco, one of the key topics that was discussed was how are we ever going to educate all of the community physicians in particular um, where there's, you know, in many respects in this personalized medicine space, I think a great divide forming. The haves, they, they refer to it as the haves and the haves nots. And, and so the, the, uh, the academic hospitals who are, are really on the forefront, I think, have a very good understanding of a lot of the things that are going on. But the people in the community hospital, number one, don't. Number two, don't have the resources to, to, to understand it. And, and so there's a lot of discussion about how are we going to educate everybody with respect to really what is the state of the art and, and, and how are we going to deliver that kind of care really everywhere. Um, and, and last but not least, of course, um, you know, those collaborations are important to us. What we want to be able to do is, is help you as, as academicians um, with good and promising technology. Our strength is to be able to uh, really commercialize that and, and I like to say take it to the world uh, and I think that's what we're good at. We're not as good at inventing, we don't have the bandwidth to do the kinds of things that are done in academia as much as we would like to and so uh, I think that's a real important area for us and certainly one that we try to seek uh, good and productive collaborations um, for everybody. So there are a number of challenges in doing all those things, I'm sure we'll get into those later and uh, you know again I appreciate the chance to be here. Actually, before we hand over to Richard, I mean, so a couple of the things you mentioned we did discuss last time, I mean, some of the, the need for this partnership with the universities. You raised a new issue that I don't recall hearing, and that is that you described people in Abbott as not being clinicians. But is, how far should we go? I mean, I, I presume there are clinicians, sure. MDs, who have come to work with Abbott. Is there something that precludes them continuing to operate as clinicians? What is the... Why can't well, and, and again, there's probably um, a difference in the uh, in, in our company. So we, we have a pharmaceutical division. We have uh, multiple diagnostics divisions, and certainly within the pharmaceutical division, I think they're much uh, much more highly represented with um, uh, with respect to their medical staff. In the diagnostics business, we certainly do have MDs that are part of our our team, um, but we cover so many different therapeutic areas. Uh, that it's often difficult to really have the kind of core expertise that we need to make the kinds of decisions that we need. So I sort of see the, the, the medical staff that we have as being um, certainly very helpful. Uh, they're very important to me as, as an R&D leader uh, because I really do need to understand and want to understand uh, what the real true impact is of the things that we're doing, uh, especially when we make trade-off decisions. It may be on performance criteria or uh, whether or not a technology will fit in a particular uh, you know, type of laboratory. But 
But I think what's most important, our medical staff really, I think, acts as a good liaison to those people who are much more expert in a particular uh, specialty. And, and so what we really, what I try to do is really use them to tap into these external resources that I think are much more familiar with the state of the art in a number of different therapeutic areas because it's very difficult for us to have resident in-house good, solid, leading edge experts on all those different places, all those different spaces. So the key is that it's not that you can't hire other people like clinicians. The key is structural that you can't have hired everybody you need to get a broad that, That's right. And we certainly, I mean, nothing prevents us from doing it other than, um, you know, we, we don't have, we, we don't on an everyday basis necessarily have the kind of need for a, a real specialist that would actually, frankly, inspire them to do great things. So it's, I think it's much more productive to us to have a good network of relationships with people that are really, I'll call it, you know, out on the forefront and, and uh, really familiar with where the fields are moving and, and, and what's really most important. Good. Thanks. Richard? Great. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come and speak tonight. Uh, I really first became aware of the need for industry and academic interactions from my mentor, Dennis Carson. Uh, and it became quite acute when I was tasked with starting the Cancer Center's current biorepository in 2006. And as a clinician, I, I see patients uh, every week. I think, uh, I'm, I think w all clinicians are, are quite cognizant of the fact that academics alone uh, really do not develop the treatments that our patients need. So we see exciting new drugs develop. We see some of our patients do well on them. But of course, many of our patients with cancer continue to do poorly and there's a vast unmet need. It's very exciting to see new drugs come out that uh, work well for small groups of patients, the precision oncology piece, is, as you mentioned, but we know that we need lots more of these if we're going to really start to cure uh, some of our patients, uh, cure more of our patients than a, than a small subset. Uh, for that reason, I was tasked with developing a biorepository that could support not only the academics at UCSD, but also support the vast biotech and pharma activity in San Diego as much as possible. So from the very beginning, we always consented our patients for for-profit end users. And the idea was very simple. We know that we cannot do what we need to do to provide the treatments our patients need alone. And we've never had a patient refuse to sign consent because of the for-profit end user clause. Patients are fully aware that the drugs that treat them come from pharma. They know that academics don't normally develop drugs from concept into INDs. There are very, very rare exceptions to parts of that process. But as the process has become more and more complex, there is more and more need for academics to partner with pharma. Uh, our biorepository has been used by pharma quite a bit, both in the diagnostic space and also in the therapeutic space. We had a large laboratory service agreement with a, a pharmaceutical company that had a local uh, presence to develop new models. Again, models that would be more representative of the disease that patients really have. So we were developing and continue to develop primary xenograft uh, mouse models that can be used to test novel drugs and hopefully be more representative of the disease our patients really face. And that uh, biorepository program continues. We continue to develop those xenografts. Actually, now as a collaboration with the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, so we, we uh, work with everyone we can to develop the tools that are needed to develop new drugs for our patients. Uh, sort of taking off the academic hat, like uh, many academicians do, uh, there are sometimes opportunities outside of academics for us, and, and that I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity outside of academics uh, to get a look at how, uh, how pharma works uh, and how biotechs work as part of a small startup biotech company that was actually part of an incubator within a larger pharma, and those were quite uh, popular, I think, for some time. And I think there were a lot of uh, real opportunities with that approach. Um, our very, very small team was not encumbered by the, the vast numbers of committees and, um, and sort of checks and double checks that sometimes restrict activities within pharma. So I, I believe that our group was very capable and agile in terms of really using the, the absolute cutting edge science to develop a high throughput assay that could then be within this uh, context of an incubator 
uh, be used in a very, very large compound library that no academic center has access to. So I think that both uh, as an academician, I, I think there are important opportunities to, uh, to work with, with industry to provide samples that industry simply cannot access at all. I mean, th there is no way, and there is no way for us to develop new precision treatments for patients without looking at the samples. It's just, it's absolutely impossible. So that's been my primary focus. But then even outside of that academic uh, space, there are opportunities for very small groups of scientists. Uh, again, you know, it's somewhat at the whim of, of pharmaceutical companies and uh, different uh, s systems like the incubator systems that have been sort of in and out of, of, of popularity to really push the envelope in terms of developing very, very novel assays and accessing some of the resources that pharma have that no one else has. So I, I think that there are opportunities on both sides of the fence to really push things forward. And I think that that will be absolutely necessary as we move into precision oncology and trying to find drugs that work for thousands of patients instead of millions of patients. Um, maybe as just a, a brief aside, I've also more recently opened a protocol where uh, samples from patients are taken for research testing, for research sequencing, and then uh, the actionable results is determined by our IRB, uh, obviously with, with input from, from the investigators, can then go on to CLIA confirmatory clinical testing. So there are, again, even within academics, uh, within academia, opportunities to really leverage the, the research side of the space with the, the highly regulated, appropriately highly regulated clinical side of the space. So, um, you know, again, as, as comments and questions come up on the topic of precision oncology, I'm, I'm happy to do my best to address some of those, those very complicated issues. Thanks. Um, before, before we um, actually go to, the, go to the audience for questions, I have a couple of uh, follow-up, and it, it occurs to me that um, not everybody in the audience may be up on what precision medicine means, so maybe you, maybe you should say something about that a, a bit here. At the yeah, and trying to define new things is, is complicated. Uh, I, I think the fundamentally of, uh, precision oncology is about biomarkers, so um, leveraging molecular biology to develop assays that predict which patients will respond to which therapies. Um, in the past, oncologists would develop, or, or, or cancer researchers would develop drugs that seem to have some general activity against cancer, and then those chemotherapeutic drugs would be essentially arbitrarily tried against all, all, all cancer types with some uh, reasonable response rate. And I think more recent develops with um, developments with drugs that are designed to target specific pathways, uh, trastuzumab for HER2-positive breast cancer, perhaps still being the best example, although there are newer examples that are also quite impressive, where when the correct drug is given to the correct patient determined by the identified biomarker being present, the response rates are tremendous, and we sometimes cure patients who previously have not been curable. So that's really the, the holy grail and, and honestly why I went into oncology and, and why I'm sitting here tonight talking about this. Okay, so let me follow up on that. So if um, I can imagine two scenarios here for opportunities for this academic industry partnership. One is to develop biomarkers that would tell you which of the, ex the existing drugs would be the best choice. And I'm going to guess, but I don't know, that that would be a relatively low-cost project. Um, it's not developing a new drug that has to be tested in, in many, many people. And so that, I, it sounds like it's a great opportunity to work well. But the counter, the other side of that would be that there may be specific drugs needed, very specific, for very few individuals. And if you have to go through that same process that would have been great for a drug that's going to go to five million people, um, is it cost effective? Maybe I should ask, I'll ask both of you, because I mean, you both might have some insights to that. So. I'm happy to start. So I think that one of the paradigm shifts that's going to need to happen, at least in oncology, is a paradigm shift from site of origin treatment to molecular treatments. And this is happening as we speak. There are um, new drugs that target pathways, the BRAF inhibitor being a, a good example, or the ALK inhibitor, where they are FDA approved for very specific indications, BRAF mutated uh, melanoma. 
Now, once that drug is approved, of course, the bar is much lower for repurposing studies. It's still a very costly endeavor, so it's not something that an academician can do on their own, but by pharma standards, it is quite cost effective, and pharma is moving in, the, I believe, the correct direction, opening what are, have been termed in the vernacular bucket trials. And these bucket trials, I think, will be the future. For instance, for the BRAF inhibitor, for any patient who has a BRAF activated cancer, who doesn't have another good treatment option, regardless of the site of origin of their cancer, as long as it's not melanoma, where of course it's already an approved drug, they can go on to this bucket trial study. And I think that that, as each of these individual targeted therapies are developed for very specific indications, uh, ALK activated, ALK translocated lung cancer, well of course we can then quickly move forward, once it's FDA approved, into an ALK bucket trial. If, if anyone with a cancer who doesn't have a good treatment option has evidence of ALK activation, of course we would want to use that drug for that patient. And that's really, I think, what's how this precision oncology movement is evolving. Of course, that's on the therapeutic side. On the diagnostic side, the way that academics, I, including UCSD, is moving is to do very broad analyses. So rather than taking a patient saying, we just opened the ALK study, now we're going to check your tumor for ALK, we can take their tumor and we can, sequencing is becoming quite inexpensive, so for DNA biomarkers, we can look across literally every known uh, potentially targetable mutation rather inexpensively. And then as quickly as possible, open these, open these bucket trials and then put the correct patient into the correct uh, treatment. So I think by moving away from the site of origin paradigm, that's going to overcome a lot of the challenges of these inc incredibly tiny patient populations. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of conversation about, quote, resurrecting um, certain therapeutic agents that may have failed in previous clinical trials, and it may very well be that that's that that is actually a very effective therapeutic agent, but you have to simply, or not simply, but you, you have to select the right patient population where that drug can be used. So I think we're going to see, and we already are seeing, quite a bit of that. Um, and again, I would agree, none of that is inexpensive, but certainly relative to uh, launch of a new drug from scratch, it, it can be quite economical. Um, and, uh, you know, also I think, I think from a diagnostic perspective, though, a lot of the new technologies are being that are being developed, especially with their, quote, broad multiplex capability, uh, clearly are bringing to the forefront a whole new host of regulatory challenges. Um, and uh, the technology, frankly, is moving at a pace, I think, that is much quicker than uh, the law can keep up with. And so a lot of us in the diagnostic space, we really, we're really challenged, I think, on two fronts. One is on the regulatory side to be able to find ways to develop the regulatory strategies that will allow us to get the approval that we, we need and want for some of these new technologies. And the other thing is, um, with uh, especially in the oncology space, uh, a lot of the testing is done with, uh, call them home brewer laboratory developed tests. And I know, uh, I, I heard recently that uh, Roche has the only FDA approved uh, BRAF assay, uh, and the uh, therapeutic calls for the use of an FDA approved test, but there are no less than 20 to 25 different BRAF assays uh, currently being build for uh, in various places. So I think the question that, that you have to ask is, how do you know what you're getting? Uh, especially if you're a physician, uh, you may not even know what BRAF assay people are using. And in some cases, even when people use a quote, better BRAF assay, let's say that may discriminate between the mutations better, the truth of the matter is there is nobody that's actually looked at that quote, better assay to really understand truly what the therapeutic response is as a result of that. So. There's a lot of confusion right now in, in terms of how to manage that and how to regulate that, what level of regulation is appropriate, and, and how do we do that in a way to ensure that these, these tests are safe and effective, but at the same time allow this technology to grow and flourish and do the things that it's clearly capable of doing. So in terms of regulatory challenges, are you, are you saying that the current landscape is that there is insufficient regulation so that, the, so that it's a wild west where people can use any test, they say, I've got a test, and, and then start tracking their patients to a different therapy based on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Wild West may be an appropriate way to describe it uh, in, in many respects. So, um, you know, certainly from an FDA perspective, what FDA is most interested in is making sure that whatever diagnostic testing is performed is safe and effective. 
uh, and that really is all centered around what the intended use of the particular test is. So um, I think there, uh, the FDA has, has really very good systems and processes in place for uh, working with manufacturers like ours to, to get the necessary approvals for, for tests that, that have a, a targeted intended use. I think where it's getting uh, uh, much more complicated when you start talking about whole genome sequencing and you start saying, instead of asking, do I have a BRAF mutation, I'm going to go find out what mutations you have. Uh, and then what do I do with all that information? And, and, and I think really the, the regulatory processes have not really yet evolved to the point where they can really fully understand how to deal with that. Okay. So we've heard from last time and from both of you a lot of things that are really good about the relationships and need for the relationships between academia and industry. Um, and I was particularly struck, uh, Richard painted a very nice picture of the large compound libraries are apparently available on the industry side. You don't have those in academia. Academia, especially clinical medical centers, have a potential, and UCSD would be an example of that, for large biorepositories of, of patient samples that might be used for testing. So that's just one of many different advantages of this. So rather than spend too much more time on the advantages, I want to ask each of you now, so what is not working about those relationships? And, um, and you may not want to bring it up, but members of the audience will if you don't, so you may as well <laughs> do that now. So, um, so maybe we'll start with I mean, that I, would, I would certainly agree. Anybody working in the oncology space, the number one issue we face every day is access to specimens. And I know even with my own group, I'm trying to say, what is it can, that we can do to be more proactive? Unfortunately, I think we seem to be very much in a reactive mode. Uh, we'll have a particular project, and suddenly we'll have a, a particular need for a certain kind of specimens, and so then we'll start the process of trying to go get those specimens, and then you get, you get IRBs involved, and you get lawyers involved, and, and it takes a very long time. Okay. Meanwhile, you're trying to keep the project moving, but you can't get the kind of data you want because you don't have the specimens. So, you know, I've really challenged my own group to say we need to find a way to have the right kind of agreements, um, the right kind of resources, and the right kind of relationships to really get access to those kinds of specimens proactively because that really is, I think, the single hardest and probably the single most important thing uh, that we need to address. And uh, truthfully, uh, everyone is saying the same thing. Everybody wants access to the same kinds of specimens. Uh, the reality is, as, as big of an issue as I would say cancer is, uh, there still is a, a relatively low prevalence of good, well-characterized and usable specimens. And uh, so I, I think that's a very fruitful area and I think we really have to just work through the mechanics of it. We need to work through the ethics of it. We need to make sure that it's all done in the appropriate way. But if you haven't used some foresight and really done that well in advance, not knowing fully what you will need, but anticipating the kinds of things you need in, in somewhat of a general way, it can really, really delay a program. So if I could just dig a little bit deeper on that, so the, the specific reason for those hurdles that you're talking about is perhaps over-concern about how much one needs to protect patients' rights to decide what happens with their tissue? As the, I mean, is that? I, I, think, I think that's part of it. You probably face those issues more close than I do. But for example, I mean, I've asked my own guys to try to see what we could do to put in place agreements with academic institutions and others where, um, you know, we would be willing to purchase specimens and, and do those kinds of things. And sometimes that's difficult to do. Uh, people, for various reasons, are not able or willing to to, to sell specimens um, due to the restrictions that they have on those. But there has to be some mechanism by which we can do that um, that allows us to get the kind of data that I think is really critical to these kinds of programs. Because because otherwise what happens is, frankly, you, you, you end up not doing enough testing. And, and I think that that uh, is really not a good thing. Um, and I think if we had ready access to specimens, we would do a lot more testing, um, which in the end I think would be good for everybody. So I think there, there are two key things that I would address out of, out of that comment or those comments. Um, one is time frames and one is purchasing specimens. So um, the, the purchasing specimens issue is, is actually in some ways easier to address, I think, because academic centers really don't sell specimens. It's, it's just not something that academic centers are willing to do. And really, everything that we do, I mean, at least the standard that I use, I'm, I'm not an ethics expert, but the standard that I myself to is 
how would this look if it was on the front page of the newspaper? I mean, it's just the simple that is standard. That's the ethics standard. There oh, isn't perfect, any other. perfect. That's the only I, one. I didn't know I was an ethical expert. Now I. <laughs> By the so. way, that, that, is, that is exactly how we would look at it, too. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> we clearly agree on that. So, so the idea of selling samples is a real problem. Um, what is acceptable is to recharge users, whether they be academic users or industry users, for the substantial cost of consenting properly collecting and properly annotating those samples. And actually, uh, it's uh, interesting that as much as everyone wants access to samples, very few people are willing to pay the cost to, of, of generating these, these high quality samples. If you ask uh, uh, Tim Lay, who did the, the first AML uh, whole genome sequencing, he estimated the cost of each sample that they collected, it includes germline collection as well, and annotation at, at $10,000 per sample. And those kinds of numbers make academicians, and I think maybe even pharma, uh, have, have severe heartburn. So the, I think part of the reason why samples aren't as readily available as we all realize they need to be is there is a vast under-recognition of the, the tremendous cost involved in running a clinical trial to collect the samples and data necessary to really feed into programs to develop new diagnostics. It's really non-trivial to do those things. Um, I guess that also interacts a little bit with the concept of time frames. Academicians and pharma, at least in my uh, re relatively brief experience, just fundamentally operate on very different time frames. So pharma is functioning on quarterly results and, and programs where a year or two is, is a very long time. For me, when I um, submit for my every other year promotion, um, I submit that 15 months in advance. Uh, if I want to hire someone or, or lay them off, that's a, you know, a four to six month process. So, so academicians, for better or worse, we, we function in an environment where things move very slowly. And as frustrating as that is for us, I think it's even more frustrating for people in pharma who we try to work with where their jobs depend on, on, on producing. So it's, it's, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I've run into is that uh, academics, uh, academicians, and the academic world moves very slowly, very cautiously, and pharma is by necessity trying to move as quickly as possible. And, and those two cultures have a very hard time coexisting and, and finding common ground. So that's really helpful. Now, now what I'm, I'm interested in is that, that neither of you have mentioned some of the biggest fears that people on the outside might have looking at this. And so I, I, I'm interested in both your perspectives. I mean, one, on the one side, I have heard often the sense that, um, that uh, in academia, um, people are tainted by turning to work with industry, which is just trying to make a buck. They don't care about the patient. Um, do you hear that? Is it sometimes true? Um, or is that actually a misperception? Yeah, I don't think that the concept of being tainted is the main issue that, that comes up, at least with this type of translational work. Um, I think the concern from the academician's point of view is that this is a, a path to academic failure. So the kind of activities that are rewarded in, in academics are publishing. It's the end of the day. You are you rewarded for publishing. And publishing in pharma is sort of, a, the, the view of, of publishing results is obviously by necessity quite different. So when, um, when academicians are approached by pharma or considering working with pharma, there is a lot of reluctance to engage with pharma because of, again, these time frames. So if, if pharma's gonna be interested in a project and, and wanna do something for six to 12 months, but to actually flush out some understanding of a problem to publish it might take two years, well, that's a major problem. If you get halfway there, you've, you've wasted that time, and if you can't get funding to complete that project and publish it, well, that's, that's a major problem for, for someone who's trying to build their career. So I, at least from my perspective, the tainting isn't so much the issue. The issue is academic success. So that it leads to the turning it around, because there is another factor that I've noticed that some of our colleagues are worried about, and that's having enough money to keep their operation going the next year. And so I've heard on the flip side from industry, and I'm wondering about Pat's thought on this, that, that, um, that there is a worry that if you're going to somebody in academia who's desperate for funding, that they might find what you want them to find and not want to tell you what you don't want to hear. 
Have you heard about that concern, or is that something that... Uh, uh, I've not personally, so I've never experienced that, and uh, frankly, I never thought about it. Oh, okay, so, well, that's very good. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I'm naive, um, but uh, no, I, I, I mean, I think you have to be careful in who you choose to collaborate with, but, um, you know, I, and I think we can all appreciate some of those struggles, but no, I've, I've never experienced that, and, and uh, you know, like I said, I, I honestly really ha wouldn't expect that. Um, that would that would be a surprise. I mean, I think uh, I can only speak for for myself and for Abbott. I think one of the things that I think is is very important to us is is operating in an ethical manner. Um, that's just the nature of the business that we're in, and uh, I think we we throughout our corporate culture um, hold each other accountable to that. So um, I would expect the same of any partner that I deal with, and. Uh, you know, I know my own experience in working with a lot of pharma companies is uh, it, it's real important to develop, quote, the right chemistry um, between the partners. And I would, I would certainly say the same thing about our academic collaborators because uh, I think trust is a key part of that. And uh, I think the important thing on these academic and industrial partnerships is to make sure that there's a, really a win-win for everybody. And, okay, that sounds simple and, and, and uh, you know, of course it should be a win-win. But I, I think sometimes that is a little bit a little bit hard to achieve because we come at it from different perspectives. With respect to publishing, I think on the diagnostic side, we certainly encourage our collaborators to publish. Um, one of the things that's becoming more and more difficult is in any agreement that we get into that is, is some sort of collaboration uh, that we, we know will be published, we certainly want to review the data before it's published, okay? And so a lot of people will accuse us of wanting to review the data so that we can basically, you know, do whatever we want to do to make sure it looks good the way we want it. That's not what we're interested in, okay? The data is the data. We know as an academic scientist, you're going to publish the data, whatever it is, and, and we certainly support that. You know, our concerns more are from a transparency standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, from an ethical standpoint. We want to make sure, really to your point, that we don't end up picking something up in the New York Times that, you know, we didn't know about, okay? so. I think that's a real misunderstanding, and, and that really is our perspective. So when our lawyers say we want to review the day before we publish it, it's not that we want to hold it up. It's not that we want to tell you how to write it. We just want to make sure that there's nothing in it that we would object to that, that, that would be not consistent with our company standards. And I want to focus on samples and access from industry to samples. So you mentioned that you don't sell samples, and I assume that you mean that you don't sell them without some other considerations involved. But can you discuss that a little more? I mean, if Abbott Labs wants access to clinical samples in order to move their research along, they have to come to academics for them. How do they get access to them? Do they have to collaborate? Or will you, in fact, under some situations, just simply sell them? Right, so I can uh, only address that in terms of what we've done. And uh, what's absolutely clear is that for a sample to be provided to industry, there has to, there's still a tie back to that sample to the patient, to our patient. And um, whether it needs to be a full-fledged collaboration I think is an open question. We certainly prefer to use it in the form of collaborations that would be given priority. Actually, the highest priority is for the academicians at our center to use them. The next priority would be for collaborations. And then in terms of providing them for the very specific purpose, I, I think this is one thing that I, I failed to mention that is important to note is that when we consent patients for sample collection for the cancer center by a repository, they're only consented for cancer for use in cancer research. So the whoever's using it, whether it be an academician or, or pharma, they have to specify what they're doing with the sample, that it is in fact cancer research and there, we have to have some ability to evaluate the, the probability that that work will be useful. So there's a use committee that reviews those requests, but at the end of the day, uh, is, a, is someone absolutely required to have a formalized collaboration? Absolutely not. If someone from uh, pharma, if we're approached by pharma for something that we feel is important for our patients, we'll help them, um, and the pharmaceutical company is willing to bear the cost of all that collect, of collecting the sample and collecting the data, uh, then I think it is very reasonable that those samples would be provided without a formal collaboration. There is perhaps one other uh, caveat to that, and this goes back a little bit to your, your point, uh, perhaps in reverse, which is 
Uh, one of the advantages of doing this in the form of a collaboration is that, again, it depends a little bit on the specifics of the assay, but we can actually be a neutral party where uh, we can keep pharma perhaps blinded as they're developing a, a test. And then uh, through that collaboration, we can basically provide some validity to what they're doing in the, in the risk that perhaps the, the people at pharma who are obviously motivated to make their project work, uh, we can um, be responsible for holding the key to unblinding. And, and when we go to publish, make it much, uh, I think, add to the, the believability of the work as opposed to um, some issues which have happened at some companies where uh, the companies have access to samples and perhaps data hasn't been as uh, clean as it, as it should have been. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting so far. I'd like to probe a little bit more into the ideal model for the academic and uh, industry uh, partnerships. I'm a strong believer in the partnerships, otherwise you don't get innovation to patients or you end up is with very healthy lab rats. So what are the uh, f factors that are important in making a strong, successful, long-term academic partnership? You mentioned trust. What are some other things that you need to take into account? You know, I guess the first thing I would say reminds me of, remember one of those seven habits of highly effective people, begin with the end in mind. Um, and, and I think that's actually real important because I think one of the things we need to be on the, I'll call it same page on is, you know, when we're done, what are we gonna do? Uh, and I know sometimes we get involved in collaborations because we want to be supportive and we'll support certain kinds of research. And uh, at the end of the day, even if it's successful, so for example, we develop a diagnostic test for some rare cancer, uh, that doesn't necessarily ensure that we're going to be in a position to be able to commercialize that as an FDA approved product. Okay? And, uh, I think that those are the kinds of things that, that I worry about a little bit because I don't want to disappoint the collaborator who's had some great results for some rare cancer and, and there's 500 or 1,000 cases a year and it's going to cost me somewhere between 10 and $15 million to develop this test and get it FDA approved. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's just not going to be a, a good thing for our company in that regard. So I, I think it is important that we have realistic expectations up front. Um, and, and then again, I think it goes back to what is the win-win, okay? What is it makes it good for you? What is it that makes it good for us? And why are we in this together, okay? And, and I think we have to have some understanding of why literally one plus one equals more than two, um, because if we can't define that, then there's probably not a, a good reason for us to do it. So, you know, that's where for me it is. It's about communication, it's about trust, it's about a common understanding of what we're really trying to achieve together, such that when we get there, we know what the next steps are and we've already sort of worked through it. I think the, perhaps the premise of the question is challenging because I, I really don't believe there is any one correct model for academics or for academics industry collaborations or probably for industry on its own. There are just so many details in the, 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 spe the specifics of any given project that I think that that's really been the challenge. If, it, if there really was one model that kind of always worked, I think we, the academic industry relations would be much easier. The, the truth is, is that for any given project, there's a lot of complexities. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to having the right people on both sides of the fence who can understand the goals and, and really navigate their own systems to make it work. And it's, it's a challenge. Even navigating one of the systems independently can be difficult. And when you try to find synergy between these two very different systems, it, it's, it's a big challenge. I wanted to ask a question of, um, about academic and industry partnerships with regard to the scale of activities and the scale of goals. It seems like we've kind of been dancing around the issue that we need to have shared goals to have a successful collaboration. And when the issue arose about specimens and you not having an adequate amount, I started to wonder about what number of specimens would be adequate for you in industry as compared to a, a clinical physician's concept of how many people is a lot for her. Because for a clinical physician, six might be really quite a huge load for a certain type of case that she is very dedicated to uh, resolving a therapeutic uh, um, uh, approach. But for Abbott Labs, that might 
be a complete, a completely inappropriate scale to be even thinking about. So I was hoping you both could address this question about how you can reach a shared, uh, um, sharing on the, the scale of the project that you want to pursue together. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know what the exact answer to that question is. For us, it would depend on where we are with a particular project. So a typical real life scenario, I might be uh, involved in a situation where either I'm developing a new product or uh, in some cases I might be trying to improve an existing product. And it's especially, I think, true in, in the case of oncology because specimens from different tissues can be very different. Um, first of all, you're usually dealing with formal and fixed specimens to begin with. Second of all, um, you're dealing with a wide variety of tissue types. So I may need to have access in a relatively short term period to, I'll call it dozens of different samples from, from, uh, from different organs so that I can optimize my sample treatment to be able to deal with all kinds of different tissue. Okay, so in, in my vernacular, that'd be a relatively small number of specimens um, to deal with, okay? Uh, on the other hand, when we get into a clinical trial, uh, it would depend a lot on the frequency, for example, of a particular genetic alteration that we may be looking for uh, that could drive me anywhere from hundreds to potentially thousands of specimens that I need access to. And, and it really all depends on, on how I need to power the study and, and, and how many, quote, positives I need to. The other thing is we often need access to a lot of specimens. And again, I'd put this in the category of probably uh, hundreds of specimens, uh, a lot of times developing a cutoff for these assays is very difficult. Um, it's not like an infectious disease test where you either have or you don't. Um, uh, when we're dealing with a lot of these genetic alterations, we're looking for low level mutations, we're looking for uh, a percentage of cells that have a particular defect. It's a lot of work and requires access to a fair number of specimens to really get a good robust cutoff. And then from the academic side, I think the, the main challenge, and obviously centers are in uh, various sizes, but even a, a, a medium-sized center, uh, hundreds of samples is, is really not a huge issue in terms of patient population. The issue is where, if, if I told you previously it cost five to $10,000 per subject to consent, properly bank the sample, and collect follow-up data, well, where does that money come from? Uh, pharma is not approaching me about investing in the, Moore's UC, the UCSD Moore's Cancer Center in terms of, oh, we want to build up a repository. We're willing to invest the money up front so that in the future, if we meet all the criteria of your use committee and, 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 uh, uh, we, and, and we uh, satisfy all those requirements, you, we can then have access to material. So I think that's maybe the real sticking point is that, the, again, the time frames are the problem. It takes a lot of time to collect these samples. and uh, investing in that sample collection is ethically challenging and probably from a business perspective not very appealing. So there's something that comes from the stem cell field that is related to this that I thought about when you mentioned that patients are specifically consented for their samples to be used for oncology research. And if somebody came along and said, I need some patient samples, tissue samples, to look at something for diabetes research, you'd have to say, we can't do that. Um, what are your th respective thoughts, just very briefly, on whether there is a hurdle that we can't overcome, and why, you know, why can't we ask people to allow their tissue to be used for more than one purpose? Other than the fact that the IRB won't let you be very general <laughs> about what. Yeah, I think that you know the the IRB is us. I mean, they're, they're academicians who are sitting on the IRB who are who are trying to do the right thing, and. I think successfully. The, the challenge in cancer, in, in setting up a cancer biorepository, is I'm approaching patients, my, my coordinators are approaching, approaching patients at perhaps the most difficult point in their entire life. So they have either just been diagnosed with cancer or there's a strong suspicion that they have cancer. They've met with a, a doctor, perhaps a cancer doctor, for the first time. And we're approaching them and asking them to donate part of their sample. We're asking them to accept for-profit end users. We're asking them to accept that their sample might be used in animal research. We're asking them to accept that we may be doing whole genome sequencing. We're asking them to accept that anonymous upload of their sequence to, uh, to public databases, read dbGaP, uh, may occur. We're, and, and, even, and that's sort of, a, I think, a very broad set of requests that we're making. And even making that in the most efficient possible way is still a five or six page document. Uh, 
even assuming the patients weren't anxious, um, our center, like all centers, are under tremendous pressure. We're very busy. There's lack of space. So where, where do we sit down and talk to a patient about these things? So there's just, there are so many uh, systematic challenges to, to doing this at all that you could always find an additional thing. Why don't we do just one more thing? And at the end of the day, uh, we par it down to what we think is absolutely necessary that we can manage to do that's most important to push the, the, the care of cancer patients forward. I mean, we are a cancer center. That's, that's, that's why we're there. Uh, so so there just, there's always a, a line that has to be drawn by necessity, practically. And there will, the, 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 the process of setting up a biorepository is choosing who you will fail in the future. So if someone approaches our biorepository and they want access to tissue samples that were properly collected to look for phosphoprotein epitopes, as of today, we don't satisfy that. Our samples sat around too long to be used for phosphoepitopes. Yes, we would like to have the perfect biorepository that can satisfy every current and future possible use. But that one sample that we could afford to collect would only be useful for one person. It wouldn't be enough to develop a diagnostic. So it, it, it's about picking, picking or doing your best to, to satisfy the, the absolute, uh, you're, you're picking your battles and you know that you're making mistakes and you're just doing your best. I want to thank both um, Drs. Grudy and Schwab for their excellent um, observations and helping us to think about these issues tonight. So give them a applause. And I want to thank all of those of you who were um, brave enough to come up and join us at the microphones and ask questions. That was very helpful for this conversation. As I've already noted, um, this is the second of three programs in our summer series. The next program is Wednesday, September 5th. And we're going to try and take some of the things that we've talked about in those first two programs and other ideas as well and talk more about solutions to the challenges that remain. Um, some of the challenges we discussed tonight may no longer be challenges, but some of those challenges that are there, we want to figure out how best to deal with those. So we are encouraging you to register early and often for that program. Um, <laughs> And finally, thank you to UCSD TV for recording tonight's program, to the Sanford Consortium for allowing, for, for allowing us to use this building and facility for our program, to the Benbow Foundation, Pfizer, Takeda, Johnson & Johnson, the Clinical and Translational Research Institute at UCSD, all of those for supporting the program and Connect for helping make this possible. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. And, um, and as you leave this evening, if you have questions or thoughts about the program, since we don't have the forms, please come and talk to me. So thank you, everybody, and have a good evening.